Hey everyone, we're back here at Edge Raffi uh, with the next video in our remote surgery clerkship preparation series. This one's going to cover suture and needles um, as well as their sizing. Uh, so once again, not really shelf information, but information that will really help make the hospital a lot less confusing and help you understand a lot of the clinical decision making that's going on around you, which I would argue is sometimes more important than, than memorizing uh, shelf trivia sometimes as far as uh, your professional development. So anyway, let's jump right in. Uh, before we start, uh, a couple of these images came from that uh, instrument guide I talked about on my surgical instruments video that the FACS put out. Um, it's an awesome instrument guide. And if you're interested in looking uh, at a non-video source of some of this information, um, you can search it on Google just like this and uh, look at that for yourself. Um, I found it helpful when preparing for this. So I'm sure some of you will find it helpful too. All right, so the first thing to talk about is suture sizing. And right off the bat, you're getting um, introduced to the confusing uh, numeric systems we use uh, in medicine. Um, so basically, I've listed suture sizes um, from low to high on both of these lines. So here, starting at zero, uh, size one is bigger than zero, two is bigger than one, and so forth. Down here, we have this interesting notation, which is four zeros in a row. That's called 4-0. And that's smaller than three zeros in a row, which is 3-0 and 2-0 and so forth, as you can imagine. Uh, so the perplexing thing is that sometimes a higher number is bigger and sometimes a higher number is smaller. And really just how the system came about is that they initially manufactured sutures in this size, 0, 1, 2, et cetera, because they thought uh, at the time uh, that a size 0 suture was the smallest they could manufacture. And then as manufacturing progressed, we realized we could make a smaller sear smaller suture than size zero. So what do you call that? They decided to call that zero zero um, or two o for short. And then as sutures got smaller and smaller, you keep adding zeros, three o, four o, and so forth. Uh, so don't let that trip you up. If it's a bigger number, but it's followed by a zero, like four o, that's actually a smaller suture than something like two o. And in your general surgery rotation, most of the sutures you'll be dealing with will be in uh, really this range from about uh, 2 to 4 -0. Um, We really don't use, it's very rare that we would use sutures um, above like a, a number one or a number two. Uh, that's another thing. So a lot of times to differentiate this, we'll call this like a number one suture as opposed to just a one. Uh, because if you just say one, people might be thinking you're going to follow that with a, like a 1-0. Or if you just said two, they might think 2 is coming. Anyway, enough of that. So now briefly to talk about suture types, there's two main differentiations to make. And I don't really want you, we've got a bunch of brand names over here. I don't really want you worrying too much about brand names. Really what we care about you knowing is the difference um, in the characteristics of the suture and why you would choose it for a specific goal. So there's first differentiation is braided uh, or monofilament. So monofilament you can think of as kind of like fishing line. Uh, there's the suture and it's made of just one strand essentially this is all just one thing whereas a braided suture has a bunch of tiny fine little strands that have all been braided into one suture that might be the same size as a monofilament like that uh, so usually what you'll see taught or hear taught is that a uh, monofilament suture since it doesn't have all these little nooks and crannies uh, is less likely to have an infection I don't know that I've necessarily seen great data for that to be the case, but that's kind of the classic teaching is that if you use a monofilament, it's probably less likely to get infected. Um, so you might think, why don't we just use monofilaments for anything? Well, braided, the big advantage is maneuverability. If you've ever dealt with something like fishing line, you know, it can be stiff or from, from my growing up, it's like tennis racket strings. The monofilament can be really stiff and difficult to manipulate. Uh, but the braided sutures, um, usually bend and uh, tie down in knots and things like that much more easily. So they're a little bit easier to handle. Uh, then the second question is absorbable versus non-absorbable. So as you, it's pretty obvious from the name, the absorbable suture will eventually be absorbed into the body uh, and stop uh, holding the tissue in place. Usually by that time, we've expected scar or healing to happen. Uh, and the body tissues can hold themselves into place without any issue as opposed to a non-absorbable suture, which in theory never goes away, is used when you uh, need that reinforcement of the tissue long-term. Um, I'd highlight one exception here, which is this PDS. Technically, it's an absorbable suture, but it's a slowly absorbing suture. So a PDS suture can be used when you need the support for a little bit longer than you need with a typical um, absorbable suture. 
uh, but that you don't need, you don't want a true non-absorbable permanent suture. Um, and so the classic issue with non-absorbable um, is that even something as small as a suture is still a foreign body and those can be prone to either irritation, especially if they're by the skin or potentially a uh, long-term infection. So depending on what we use uh, on what we're doing, we, we do have very relatively specific uh, indications where we almost always use absorbable suture and um, times when we almost always use non-absorbable suture. Uh, and here we have some of these examples uh, in this table as well. So right here when it says internal anastomosis, it's talking about a bowel anastomosis. Um, something like Vicryl um, is a pretty common suture you use there. It's braided and it's easy to handle and it's absorbable. So it's going to go away once the bowel has healed together uh, and hopefully not cause you any more issues. On the other hand, if you're doing something like skin closure, a lot of times you want a monofilament suture. You don't want um, any sort of infection by the skin and uh, handling of the suture is not that important. Um, and then when we're closing the fascia, uh, which is something you'll see a lot as medical students, we usually use that exception suture that I talk about called PDS, where you need support for a long time, but it's still absorbable because you don't want big irritating knots uh, in the abdominal wall. And then things like non-absorbable sutures, usually if we're dealing with blood vessels, we don't want those to ever come loose and uh, bleed everywhere. Or even when we're hooking up blood vessels together, uh, that we want a non-absorbable suture uh, like proline or something like that. So those are kind of the basics about how we think about suture and how to choose them. But really just remember these kind of two sets of two categories and you should be able to kind of reason your way through which one you might want in which scenario. All right, another consideration to think about when we're talking about suturing things is your needle type. Um, the main point I wanna make here is that a tapered needle is kind of the default. I've always thought of needles as a sharp thing. So it's made sense to me that the cutting needle would be the default. Uh, but it's actually this taper design. So a tapered is right here. It's kind of like a cone or a pyramid where the only sharp part is right here at the end. So it goes into the tissue and the tissue kind of spreads around it as the diameter gets wider, but it doesn't actually cut the tissue further to cause that spreading. Uh, so it causes less tissue damage and it's usually what we use because generally you, you don't want tissue damage when you're trying to suture something together and you're gonna have it stay and heal over the long term. Whereas a cutting needle, um, as you can see, it's more of a pyramid than a cone. So it's a triangle and each of these edges uh, is sharp. Um, so it, as it passes through the tissue, it pokes through the tissue with this tip and then it keeps cutting it along the sides here. So it causes a lot more tissue damage, uh, but sometimes that's actually okay if you're doing something like trying to cut through the skin, which is so tough that you will have trouble cutting it with just a tapered needle. But like I said, if you're curious, almost always the answer, uh, or if you're curious about like a needle that you're using as a tap tapered or cutting, it's almost always going to be uh, a tapered needle. All right, so a few more things, uh, just talking about sizes and needles. Um, these are the hollow needles. So the needles we dealt with back here, these are like suturing needles, which have no uh, space in the middle. These hollow needles are like the ones that we use to start IVs. Um, and those are measured in a size called gauge. So as you can see over here, um, we have something like 14 gauge, which is the biggest and 27 gauge, which is the smallest that we see here. Usually they'll be color coded, something like this in your hospital as well. So it's really easy to see when you're digging for stuff. Uh, and why this matters is that the size of the needle that you use to create the IV and the sizes of the tubing that you use in the IV dictates the flow rate, uh, which might matter in something like a trauma resuscitation. You need to give somebody a lot of flow of blood uh, in a short time. You need to know what size IV you need for that. ATLS says you need a large bore IV. Well, what does that mean? Uh, in gauge, it means around a 14 to a 16 gauge IV. So paradoxically, the lower numbers have a higher flow rate. Uh, and why is that? Well, basically, uh, this system came about uh, when people were developing metal wires. If you think about you start with a metal tube, this might be, say, zero gauge, and then they stretch it out. And one stretch uh, increases the gauge by one. So now this is a gauge one, and then you stretch that again, and it gets longer. And now this is gauge two. So each time the gauge goes up, that's a measure of that they stretch the metal. Um, out an additional time to give it additional length, uh, but which would by nature make the diameter smaller. So paradoxically, bigger number, smaller needle. Um, I've always thought that the story about how that came into play helped me remember uh, 
uh, why that was the case, because as we'll see shortly, not every uh, bigger number, even in relation to things like IVs, uh, means a smaller size. All right, so we just talked about the gauge, and now I want to talk about French sizing. So what does that mean? Um, the technical term or the formula for it is that you take the diameter of your catheter, this is technically the outer diameter uh, in millimeters, then multiply by that by three. Uh, but don't worry about the formula, it doesn't matter. The point is that a bigger French number is a bigger tube, which you'll see is the opposite of gauge. And yet sometimes we'll refer to IVs as gauge and sometimes we'll refer to them as French. So you really have to keep that straight. And why this matters is something like when you're pulling out one of those IVs, how much pressure do you need to hold to stop bleeding? Well, if you have a, a big 10 French sheath, that's going to need a lot more pressure uh, than something like a 5 French sheath. So that becomes very clinically relevant when you're thinking about stuff like this. Uh, for example, we have two different central lines or big IVs that go into the veins here. Um, and this one is called a triple lumen. Typically, that's 7 French. And this one, as you can see, is a trialysis line. Usually, that's around a 13 French. If we're actually looking at the uh, uh, sort of French sizing chart, you can see there's a pretty significant difference there. So you got seven French over here and 13 over there. If you're thinking about a hole that size um, in your blood vessels, that really matters. Uh, and then when you're th thinking about the biggest sheets, things like ECMO, things like that, those can get up as big as 24, 22, and those need to be surgically removed. Um, so once again, French, bigger number is bigger, but gauge, remember we're stretching that wire, bigger number is actually smaller. And yes, we use them both when we're talking about lines. Uh, why? I don't know. But what do I know? I'm an American. I still don't know my height in meters. So I guess I can't complain about archaic measuring systems. All right. So that's it for our video. And it went a little bit longer than I anticipated, but hopefully not too long uh, to be too boring or not helpful. Um, like I said, this is not really shelf material, although some of it kind of relates. This is really about helping you uh, really quickly pick up that information that you usually take a lot of time to learn over osmosis in the hospital. Um, and hopefully it will be useful to you in your rotations. Uh, these videos are for educational purposes only. Don't use them to diagnose or treat any diseases. Um, and this was made with Edger Studio, preparing surgical education one image at a time. Thanks.